Hey folks, this is Rabble Rouse and Rich Bergeron. Ladies and gentlemen, the Tornado Tony Pettico. And Psychic Tom Padgett with his crystal ball ready to go. Alright, well, we've got... Uh, I'm, I'm not going to Guadalajara. You what? I'm, I'm, I am not going to Guadalajara, Mexico. Oh, to see to see the fights this weekend? Two days ago that they're... The Canelo fight might be announced in 48 hours. They said that two days ago. I haven't heard nothing. That's 48 hours. But they said it's going to be John Ryder, May 6th, in Guadalajara, Mexico. Oh. I'm not going in there. I'm not happy about this. Well, then. Well, you, you know, maybe it's a good thing because like I, said, I was talking to possibly a Vegas trip, and then some of my friends are like, oh, we'll, we'll go, we'll go. Now, I don't know if they'd go to the fight or not. You know, but oh, we'll go, we'll go. And then it's like, well, they're all mad at me anyway, so it's like, I don't want to chance booking this, and then and them all giving me the big F you. So that would kind of suck. So I mean, maybe, maybe this is a blessing in disguise. <laughs> all right, then. Um, I, have, I have a tendency to annoy people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> well, anyway. I, I um, I'm so quiet and yellow, you know? Speaking of Canelo, I don't think um, your favorite fighter in the whole wide world will be fighting Canelo anytime soon. Mr. Jake Paul took his first loss over the weekend. We, we know you love him so much, Tony. Uh, he made a actually, it, he made an interesting comment before the fight. Um, and I don't know if he had said this before, but it's the first time I heard it, so I'm going to just share it with everybody. Um, he said that I would rather be the uh, ass of boxing than the face of boxing. <laughs> and uh, not only did he prove that with the fight itself, but uh, his excuses after the fact. He said he was sick, he had an arm injury, I mean, you name it, he, he gave it as an excuse, so... We'll start with that card. That happened on Sunday in Saudi Arabia. Um, and there's another thing I found out on Sunday that I was not aware of. Um, Saudi Arabia has a huge budget for sports. Um, and you might yeah. remember the UFC was actually owned by a company in Dubai um, that was also part owner of Ferrari. Uh, and it was backed by the government of Dubai. So, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of money in that territory, in that, that region. Um, a lot of oil money in Saudi Arabia. So, um, they put on, really, a top-notch promotion. Not really, you know, big-name fighters, but everybody who's anybody in the sport of boxing was in attendance. Um, and they probably invited them and paid for everything. Uh, I don't know that for a fact, but I would assume so, because... Um, Mike Tyson made the trip. Amanda Holyfield was there, uh, and, and uh, just just a bunch of um, dignitaries. So anyway, um, I was watching pretty much the entire fight card. Uh, I watched, uh, you know, the couple guys that were obviously hometown favorites, like uh, Badir Sam Ring. He was. I thought it was rude, though. The announcer for that fight. Uh, Badir Samreen, he's undefeated. I don't know how old he is. Um, but this guy was like, I think he should hang him up because he's not doing it for the love of the sport. He's doing it for the money. <laughs> like, what? The guy's 7-0. and like, Wait for him to lose before you tell him to hang it up, whether he's doing it for the money or not. And he TKO'd his guy, who was 23-9, and nine, in the first round. <laughs> what? Why would you tell somebody to hang him up after that kind of effort? No matter what he's doing it for. Um, so whoever that announcer was, I don't, I don't exactly know who he was, but that, that was pretty stupid. <clears throat> uh, and then the co-main event, uh, Badu Jack, 27-3-3, uh, three and three, came in there and put yeah, on a pretty good performance against Ilunga Jr. Makabu. Those were probably the two most established boxers on the entire card. I mean, they were. Um, Makabu looked a little bit rusty. He was, uh, he was coming off a little bit of a layoff. And he just, he didn't have very good defense. 
but it was a back and forth fight. They were both scoring points, and then Badu Jack just came in there and laid him out a couple times, and he won the WBC World Cruiserweight title with this one. And it was the final round of the fight, so I think he would have won on the scorecards anyway, but it was pretty interesting. I mean, uh, it was a little bit back and forth, but you could tell Jack had the advantage, and uh, he seemed like the fresher fighter. He seemed like uh, the more aggressive guy. And uh, Makabu had one of the most miserable-looking ring walks I have ever seen. <laughs> I don't know if you guys caught that. But he looked defeated as he was walking to the ring before it even started. He looked like he just, like, uh, got told somebody in his family died or something. He's walking out there, like, head down, and just, like, just miserable. So, yeah, I could kind of tell that that's how it was going to end. I didn't, I wouldn't have predicted the 12th round knockout, but... I mean, it, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, you look back at something now, and, and you think, and it's like, and it makes a lot more sense, but, uh, even long before his breakdown, Oliver McCall used to cry, I walk into the ring. <laughs> like, the fight where he knocked out Lennox Moon, yep. he was walking to the ring, he was actually physically crying. Uh, same thing when he fought Larry Holmes, he's walking to the ring, and he's... Yep. I mean, he's like, you can see, he's like, like broken up, like, 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 like sobbing. And, uh, you know, obviously one of the most famous upsets in history, um, Mike Tyson getting beat by Buster Douglas. Buster Douglas had lost his mother just before the fight, so speaking of deaths in yeah. the family, um, he was pretty bent out of shape. <clears throat> uh, but t the main event there, of course, was uh, Jake Paul versus Tommy Fury. I thought it was supposed to be a 10-round fight. It turned out to be an 8-round fight. And uh, Tommy Fury specifically requested a smaller ring than usual. They had talked about that a little bit in the earlier part of the broadcast. So, thought that was interesting. Um, basically, uh, I mean, I didn't really see like close enough to score the rounds. Uh, I kind of saw bits and pieces of it because I was trying to get the free feed to work, and it worked for all the other fights, but it was giving me problems for the Fury Paul fight, and there was like a big advertisement in the middle of the screen for the part, the part that I could watch. Um, but I noticed, you know, there was points taken away from each fighter, and um, it was uh, kind of a situation where it looked like the ref was trying to steal the show. A lot of people had that comment. Um, but Jake just, uh, just did not look like he has in his past few fights. I mean, he looked like he was frustrated. He looked like um, that bet was a bad idea that he made to double or nothing with Tommy Fury because obviously that gave, I don't know if it was the difference in the fight, but that gave Tommy Fury just enough incentive to make sure there was no way he could lose that fight. Uh, and if not for the American judge who ruled in favor of Jake Paul, uh, he probably would have had a unanimous decision. Uh, and he definitely made sure he, he got the exclamation point and the win. <coughs> Um, but yeah, it just, it wasn't spectacular on Fury's part, but he basically just did just enough to win and doubled his purse. Um, made, I think, uh, Jake Paul made something like 20 million and he made 14 or 16 million. So life-changing payday there for Tommy. Uh, and, and there's going to be a rematch, it turns out. Uh, Jake Paul had been, uh, eyeing, um... Nate Diaz, which I didn't know, know last week. I would have said something about it, but uh, that was that was his look past Fury fight. He he wanted uh, Nate Diaz, so now that's pretty much dried up that opportunity, and it looks like there's going to be a rematch of this one. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, definitely uh, more impressive to me that Jake Paul hung with Fury for the entire fight and didn't get damaged much. He had a little bit of a welt on his forehead, but that was about it. Um, so, win or lose, I mean, he's he's in boxing to stay, I think. Uh, it's just, you know, we've got to calm down this Canelo Alvarez <laughs> matchup talk. And world champion, you know. ESPN put out a big report that got taken up by a bunch of different outlets and promoter across the world went viral. Can 
Tom, can Jake Paul ever become an actual champion in boxing? I, I doubt it. I would think that um, he's probably going to go 10 to 15 fights and then call it a career because he's got a lot of other business stuff that is going to be uh, probably more lucrative and safer, obviously, because um, he's got to be feeling the, you know, the, the brain effects of jumping into boxing as a complete amateur. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't see him sticking with it for a 10-year career. But anyway, uh, on the undercard, we also had a couple other good fights. Um, Moussin Kaysan at Cruiserweight knocked this guy down with the very first punch. That was, that was pretty good. Uh, Tariel Jafarov had had too much in the first round, so he didn't even come out for the second round after that. Um, and then we had um, a guy they called the Pride of Saudi Arabia. No, the Pride of the Arab World, this guy. Guess what his record is. The Pride of the Arab World. What? 1-0. and oh. <laughs> Going in. He had one win, and he's the Pride of the Arab World. Ziad Al-Mayouf. Now, he did win by unanimous decision over a very game Ronald Martinez, who, who did, did not seem to have gotten the memo that he was supposed to let the hometown guy win. <laughs> yeah. He came in at 3-1-1, one, and, one, and uh, he definitely, uh, if he took bribe money, he, he didn't show it. <laughs> so that was a four-rounder unanimous decision for Ziad. Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty interesting. The pride of the Arab world. <laughs> I can't get over how funny that was. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we had some Showtime fights on Saturday as well. I uh, decided to uh, hop in on the betting because I had a good I had a good weekend uh, overall on the betting. I got I got two big bets that paid off. One was a parlay. And you won't believe it, but it was golf and Bellator. <laughs> Parlay ended up uh, yeah, being like seventy-five bucks on um, Amosov, Araslav Amosov, the Ukrainian guy who come back from war to uh, to get back into the Bellator cage. I, I had him to go the distance, and Christian or Chris—I don't know if it's Christian, Christopher, probably. Chris Kirk, who is right up in the leaderboard of the um, of this week's event, but he he went to overtime in the Honda Classic last week, and I've become suddenly a big golf fan. Where I used to say uh, it's the dumbest sport in the world <laughs> because uh, I picked Kirk with my very first golf bet ever, um, and DraftKings actually gave me a a odds boost or a profit boost or something like that. I think it was odds boost. So he, he was at like 3,500 odds or something like that. So I got 3,800. So I bet just him alone on that bet and won $73. And then another 75 bucks for the parlay. Uh, so that was good. Uh, big weekend overall. And I won a little bit of a NASCAR bet. I had just about everybody in the top 10 for most of the race. But once... Bush started getting into the lead, I realized I had to do an in-game bet on him. So since his odds were pretty low, even though they were in the plus, I, I added a couple a couple other sports events. I think there were, I might have been a fight in there. So anyway, I, I won that bet. It's like a $15 bet. But, so those were my, my three uh, crazy wins. But it was a good weekend. I, I didn't really win a lot on the fights. Uh, I tried to string together a couple big long parlays. I only won one of them, one smaller one. Uh, but it didn't help that Ryan Spann and uh, Nikita Krilov got canceled because Krilov showed up to the um, UFC complex and uh, ended up having an illness. So he was not able to fight that night. And apparently... Um, Ryan Spann was so devastated he cried when he found out. Talk about crying. <laughs> cried when he found out. He was just devastated. Uh, I'm trying to find Saturday's showtime fights, I guess. Must not have put the two star up there. 
UFC card was uh, the other one that screwed me over was um, when the main event ended up being uh, Brendan Allen. Um, I forget who he fought. Some Eric guy. Eric's, Eric something. Anyway, um, I had him by decision. I had one of those double choice him by decision or the other guy by submission. And. <laughs> Ended up, he, he got the submission with 30 seconds left in the fight. <laughs> All he had to do was go the distance. And, uh, yeah, so I was pretty pissed off about that one. Anyway, we'll find this short time card here. There it is. So, Subriel Mateus was in the main event versus Jeremiah Ponce. We talked about him last week. He, he, he was undefeated going in. Uh, Subriel was actually the big-time favorite, and uh, I did have a bet on him to win by decision. Uh, but, uh, boy, it was uh, you could have had the fight in a phone booth. <laughs> and they do actually have phone booth fights now. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it, but it's pretty hilarious. They got one of those old school like um, Doctor Who phone booths <laughs> from, from the original Doctor Who series on PBS back in the day. D and dating myself with that reference, but um, Subriel and Jeremiah like just had just obviously an, an unsustainable pace, um, just leaning up against each other and just throwing everything. Very little defense. All offense from both of them. And uh, at Ponce was given just as good as he got, but uh, his corner decided he'd had enough. And the doctor came over and checked him, and he said he was fine, and you know went over there, shook his hand, but he did not. Um, he did not argue with his corner. I think it was his father in the corner. One of those situations, and it wasn't a throw in the towel thing. He just came back to the to the corner at the end of the fifth round, and that was it. Thought he had had enough, and I think he did go down once, but it was more of an off balance type of knockdown, I thought, than him really being hurt. He, he jumped right up, he came right back, and fought through the rest of the round, and then he yeah, said, "Nope, that's enough." Uh, but Subriel actually showed more damage to the face. He had a big, huge egg on on his uh, forehead. So I had bet Ponce going in, um, just a little bit, but still it pissed me off. It, it, it wouldn't let him finish the fight, uh, at least go into the next round. You know, if he was still taking that kind of punishment, yeah, call it off. But uh, I was not not impressed with the stoppage. And we had uh, Kudratillo Abdu Kakarov, 18 and one, losing an unanimous decision to Vashon Owens, who came in at 13 and three. So he improves to 14 and 3 there. And then our Elvis fight of the week. I, I bet against Elvis. I know I shouldn't have done it, but I did. I bet against but Elvis. Why would you do this? <laughs> Just because he was the favorite. And, you know, you got to bet more money to win less money uh, in that situation. So Adorno was positive odds. And, uh, I mean, they came in with pretty decent comparable records. Both of them had one loss. Adorno had two draws to go with it, and uh, all of those two draws and one loss were in his last three fights. So, you know, that's what I should have looked at, but I kind of went on impulse uh, during the fights. When the early fights had started, I, I picked Adorno and Palmetta. And uh, Elvis beat Adorno, and then Jamal James came in and won a unanimous decision against Alberto Palmetta. And I, I thought James actually kind of cruised. He, he kind of was like on autopilot. And he had said at one point, I thought he said he, he, he fucked me up that round because Palmetta had a really good round. And he came back to the corner, Jamal James, and he said to his corner something about something fucked me up. And, and then the announcers clarified it and said he, he said COVID because he had COVID. So I think he was dealing with some some conditioning. 
problems. But he definitely used his height to his advantage. Palmetto just couldn't get in there and get the scoring opportunities he needed. He couldn't string together the, the hard combos. But he was the harder puncher for sure. That's uh, just James had that long reach and good jab. That was it. And then we had our uh, lone knockout KO of the match. Derek Jason Jackson, sorry, improves to 11. No, lost his first fight. Falls to 10 and 1 against Willie Jones at welterweight. Who improves to 9 and 2 there. So that was the big card last week. We also had um, fights in Orlando for a couple of obscure titles. There was a no contest, actually, between Nestor Bravo and Jair Valtierra for the WBO and ABO Super Lightweight title. Uh, that's probably, what are the odds of this on one card? A no contest and a split decision draw. Uh, Adrian Panero came in at 10-0 against Isaiah Thompson, 7-2-1 and at Cruiserweight, and uh, went six rounds, and this was a split decision draw. And then the main event, Antonio Vargas, 15-1, and one, against Michelle Banquez, 20-2. That went six rounds, and it was a TKO win for Vargas. He won the WBA Continental America's Bantamweight title there. Boost 16-1. So then, we go to tomorrow night. We actually have some pretty decent fights. stars on that too. Tomorrow night we have in speaking of Mexico, not Guadalajara, but we have uh, some fights in Tijuana. Jose Cayetano, 22 and 7, fighting Victor Reyes Burnaby, 21, 2 and 1 there at Bantamweight. And we go all the way across the pond to the UK for Jack McGann, 7, 0 and 1. Might seem like a mismatch, but he's fighting a guy, Laszlo Toss, who's 31, 6, and 2. He's had one of those draws and one of those losses in his last six fights, but this one's for a vacant IBO European Super Welterweight title. And then we got to uh, go down, back down to the southern region, to Cordoba, Colombia. Jose Alberto Arias, 9 and 1 against Nicholas. Augustin Vergara. This is Saturday, by the way. It was 5-0. Uh, Aries 9-1. That's a super bantamweight fight. Uh, that's pretty much the biggest one on that card. Yeah, here's one uh, from Germany. Agit Cabiel, 22-0, a heavyweight, fighting Agron Smakichi. <laughs> that's a good name for a boxer. Smakichi. Smackisi, Smackisi, I don't know. S M A K I C I. That one's for the EBU European Heavyweight title. Right. And then, I don't know, this is in Mexico too, in Culiacan. We got Angel Fierro, this one's on the zone. We got <laughs> good boxing star to talk about the zone. In a few minutes, but we'll get through this first. Uh, Fierro, 20 wins, one loss, two draws, fighting Eduardo Estella, who is 14 and 1. This one's for a title, the WBO NABO lightweight title. And then we go to Barcelona, Spain, crisscrossing the world here. 17 and 0, Alejandro Moya, fighting Walid Oiza, who is 16 and 2 for the EBU super lightweight title. And we don't have a Jesus fight yet, but we got an Abraham fight. 20 and 4 with one draw. Abraham Montoya fighting 19 and 1 Musa Golem. Who has 19 and 1. <laughs> That's super featherweight. Okay, and another one over in the UK on Saturday. Uh, number 37 super lightweight in the world against number 29. Lewis Ritson is number 37. He's 23 and 2. O'Hara Davies is 24 and 2. So excellent matchup on paper and we got a somebody's O's got to go on undercard at featherweight. And Thomas Patrick Ward comes in 33-0 and 1. That one draw was in uh, the fight before last. And then he is fighting Odebeck 
Kolmatov, who's just 10-0. Uh, and then we get to the one I've got to bet on. Brandon Figueroa. 23-1-1, one one, fighting Mark Magseo, 24-1-0. Uh, as for the WBC Interim World Featherweight title, and as I said before we got on the broadcast, Figueroa has a good chance of winning by knockout because the last three fights he has won by knockout. Both of them have recent losses. Uh, Figueroa, just the second to last fight was a loss. He also has a draw in his last six, and Mike Sayo uh, has a loss in his last fight, which I think was by decision. I'll check on that. Um, and we also have a somebody so has got to go on the undercard of this one. Elijah Lorenzo Garcia, 13-0, finding Emilcar Vidal, who is 16-0. It's a little bit more well-matched than the other one. Uh, Enrico Gogokia, 13-0-2 on the card as well, against Samuel Taya, who's 18-4-1. That one's not available for a betting. Uh, Jarrett Hurd, he is a huge favorite going into this one. He's 24 and 2, fighting Jose Armando Resendez. He's just 13 and 1. And Justin Deloach, 19 and 5, fighting Trayvon Marshall, who's 7 and 0. Let's check there. Uh, so Figueroa had a majority decision loss to Stephen Fulton, who uh, came in at 19 and 0 for that fight back in uh, November of 2021. Came back and TKO'd Carlos Castro who had a similar record to Magseo, just 27 and 1. Won that one by TKO in the 6th. So, and then we go to Magseo. Very tough Filipino fighter. Um, he had Ray Vargas in his last outing. Um, so, both of them have their one loss by decision, but um, Magseo, even though it was his very last fight, lost to a little bit better competition. Instead of a 19-0 fighter, he lost to a 35-0 fighter. Uh, and it was a split decision loss instead of a majority decision. So, that's kind of my, my um, analysis math going into this one for picking Magseo. Is that uh, the other guy's a knockout artist? And uh, Meg say was only lost by decision. And, uh, you know, I think he's going to be more motivated after a loss rather than the other guy after a TKO win. So we'll see. I mean, I haven't really seen much of, uh, much of their fights. I've read a little bit about Meg say, although, because um, the guy that we had on our show just like over a decade ago, uh, writes about boxing. I see his stuff all the time on Facebook. He, he wrote a big feature story about him. I say, uh, I think they're both Filipino. So that's that card. We go to... Oh, this has got to be our mismatch of the week here. In San Diego. Uh, Lazaro Lorenzana. Nice Italian name there. 9-0, fighting Cameron Crail, who's 19-25-3. I'm not sure why they're calling this a two-star fight here <laughs> on the box rec, but it is what it is here. Uh, and we've got not our Jesus fight of the week, but our angel fight of the week in Tijuana again. Uh, and it's a somebody's always got to go. Enor Abdurahimov. Abdurahimov, 10-0, fighting Angel Daniel Garcia Molina. He's 14-0 for the IBF North American Super Featherweight title. And then Ruben Eduardo Aguilar, 20-0, fighting Ricardo Salas Rodriguez, who is 16-2. That's in uh, Tijuana. And the Russian heavyweight title on the line over in Ekaterinburg. Gregory Unovidov, 7-0, fighting Arslan Yalyev, who is 13-0. Well, somebody's always got to go fights this week. Okay, spectacular on the rest of that card. Uh, then we go down to Buenos Aires. 
Oh, that's that's the 10th of March. And that one was Tuesday in the carrier bird, so we're getting ahead of ourselves. So that's the uh, previous and upcoming boxing action. Now we got to go, before we go to um, all the uh, UFC and Bellator and one championship and PFL cards, that's everything this week to talk about. We have to talk about a new phenomenon. You know, and um, the last time we talked about a new boxing thing, we had a guest on. That was cage boxing, and apparently it never went anywhere. But I really like the concept, uh, but I haven't heard a thing about it. Um, but uh, actually, you know, we had uh, we had the announcer and uh, a couple of great interviews with um, the the beat, bare knuckle guy. Uh, Drawing a blank on his name. But, um, I'd love to get Damon Feldman back on and talk to him about it. I've been getting emails about the promotion and everything um, that are actually coming directly from him. I don't know if he actually reads the responses, but I'm probably going to try to get him back on the show. We had him on, Jesus, probably like six or seven years ago now. Uh, yeah, it was a while ago. Um Last time I talked to Damon, he Hank was still alive, because they actually called me from Hank's house when Hank was probably at summer before he passed away. Um, they called me, I was at work, they called me and it was like, Hank says, there's number, and every time I would say Hank's number, knowing how sick he was at the time, he'd always fear for the worst. And it was him and Damon hanging out, and they decided to call me. Yeah, he's uh, he's doing well with it. They're doing stuff all over the world, really. Um, yeah. I think they're in London this week. Um, and they're attracting some really big names. Um, ben Rothwell was one of the big UFC stars to just recently move over there, and he's doing pretty well with it. Um, <clears throat> big Ben, they call him. And uh, it's just... Uh, I'm surprised, though. There's, I mean, they put stuff out about the the betting odds and everything like that but I can't I can't find it anywhere on DraftKings so it might be you know one of those things in certain states allow it certain other states don't but uh, this is a different thing it's going to be on the zone March 4th here um, tag team boxing <laughs> how do you like that what do you think about that concept Tommy <laughs> I love it. Okay. Boxing. Hey, man. If they, if they, if they work it out like, like professional wrestling, it would be very exciting. You know, you get one fighter, he's like, you know, taking a beating, and then, like, the other two fighters beat on him, like, they're tagging in back and forth, they can turn beat on him, and then the fighter getting the beating, lands a punch, and then he's able to get to his corner of what they used to call the hot tag in pro wrestling. And the other guy would come in like a house of fire and start dropping everybody. That could be entertaining. <laughs> There are rules. There's, there's a whole list of rules here, so we're going to go through those. But uh, I'm, I'm assuming there's no off the top rope oh, action. Cool. There's no Superman punching type stuff. But um, uh, the teams, it's going to be a tag team bout with two teams of two boxers, each their own tag team. And during the bout, one member of each tag team shall partake in the bout, subject to regular boxing rules. Uh, the member of each tag team not participating in the tag team bout. The substitute shall stand on the ring apron outside the ropes of the ring behind their team's corner unless permitted to leave the apron in accordance with the rules. The substitute may not enter the ring unless tagged by the fighter in accordance with Clause 2. The substitute shall at all times follow the instructions of the local commission and referee of the tag team bout. 
A tag is executed once a fighter touches gloves with the substitute, at which point the referee shall signal a break, separate the fighters, and allow a substitution to happen with the fighter becoming the substitute and vice versa. So it's not, it's not like strict wrestling tag teams where it's just immediately into the action. There's actually a break, which is going to be interesting. Okay, so a tag can happen at any point during the bout. However, each fighter has a duty to always protect themselves and may be disqualified or have a point deducted for tagging during any period where the referee believes the tag to be unsafe. So that's a new element. Uh, and then immediately following a tag, the opponent must follow the instructions of the referee and keep a safe distance from both the fighter and the substitute. For the avoidance of doubt, the substitute shall be permitted to enter the ring unimpeded by the opponent. So that's, an, again, another big difference from wrestling, where it's just immediately right into the fray. Uh, once the substitution has been made, the tag team bout will continue at the direction of the referee. And... <coughs> The substitute must be available to tag at all points during the bout. Uh, and he shall not touch the ring ropes unless reaching for a tag. Uh, he may hold the corner post in the event fighting occurs near their position. Uh, and then he shall stand back to avoid any interference with the action unless reaching for a tag. Uh, and, and a substitute cannot refuse the tag. That's... <laughs> I don't know if that's ever happened in wrestling. <laughs> that's an interesting uh, element. You know. Uh, that's good. That's good. That's good for Italian, the guy in there. <laughs> no, no, man. You're all. Yep, yeah, that's all you. <laughs> uh, where a substitute is ruled unable to partake in the substitution, following a tag by the referee due to injury, illness, or any other matter, that tag team will lose the bout by TKO. No limit to the number of tags. Tag cannot place, take place during the referee's count following a knockdown. And time will not be stopped during a substitution. Well, what do you call a break? I mean, oh, time. So the time will keep ticking. But there'll be a break. Okay, I get it. Okay. Uh, fighter and substitute must complete a substitution without delay. The referee may call time, warn, or take a point from a tag team that is purposely delaying or slowing down the substitution process. So you, you can't go out there and be uh, walking slow. So the winning team wins by regular boxing rules. Scorecards are aggregated based on the performance of the fighters. Uh, as though both tag team members are one person. If a member of a tag team is knocked out or a technical knockout is ruled by the referee, the other tag team shall win. Okay, so then there's a, a bunch of ancillary rules. And the date, March 4th, start time, 7 p.m. And the event is set to get underway at well, 7 p.m. Um, And the zone will be streaming in 200 countries across the globe. And it's going to be, uh, it looks like a foreign situation. I don't know where, oh, it's at the Telford International Center in England. But they got some weird names. The Los Pineda Coladas versus Ice Poseidon. And then uh, there's going to be an Anthony Vargas fight card underneath it. I don't know. So, oh, there's regular boxing surrounding it, I guess. Uh, Jay Swingler versus Nickel Mayo, super middleweight. Darren the Great, this is, must be like a YouTube type card. Dean the Great versus Pulley Arif for Dean the Great's MF middleweight title, lightweight title. King Kenny versus Ash Rock Sue, cruiserweight fight. Astrid Wet versus AJ Bunker. For the vacant MF women's flyweight title. I don't know what MF is. It must be the crazy promotion they're doing this with. Uh, Ginty versus Halal Ham, a cruiserweight fight. And Waleed Sharks versus IPAP, lightweight. Tempo Arts versus Godson, heavyweight. I don't know if these are all tag team or not. But it seems like only one of them is marked in bold here in this article. B. Dave and Luis Pineda versus Ice Poseidon and Anthony Vargas. Oh, okay. So that's where the Vargas fight card comes in. So those are the two boxers' names uh, on each team. And it's a light heavyweight tag team boxing match. So I don't know if this is just an experiment or they're going to be doing continuous events. But 
So yeah, those are the rules. It's going to be on the zone. It's going to be interesting, that's for sure. I'll have to find highlights of that. Anyway. Uh, Darren Till, out of the UFC, uh, actually requested his own release. Um, he asked to be released from his contract, and he said they happily agreed. <laughs> Uh, he says he's got some big plans, but did not really um, expound on what those were. Uh, had some injuries in recent years, had some tough losses, but he wants to focus on issues outside of fighting, apparently. He moved up to middleweight in 2019, following an unsuccessful title challenge in September 2018, with a second round knockout defeat by Jorge Masvidal at UFC London, beat Kelvin Math Gastelum on his debut, but then lost to Robert Whitaker, Derek Brunson, and most recently, Dricus Duplessis, who was fighting this weekend. Last December, he lost that one. And this is big news. Um, it actually kind of aligns with a guest we're going to have next week. Uh, he was actually supposed to be on tonight, but... Um, guy named Matt Bergen, B-E-R-G-E-N. Almost exactly the same spelling as mine, except we're in... Or an O. <laughs> uh, no, another G E. Uh, and, and an R. But uh, Matt Bergen, he is starting. Um, I'm sure you've heard of uh, the, the model. He's building it after, but it's going to be called Fighters Only instead of uh, Only Fans, uh, which is getting pretty popular. Um, but it's going to be uh, fighters only. There's not going to be any nudity or anything like that. It's nothing sexual, but <laughs> it's going to be a community mm -hmm. yeah. where where guys uh, and girls in the fight game can interact with fans and, and each other, and uh, they're going to be getting uh, benefits of something called Yeti Coin. So it's going to be cryptocurrency based. And it's going to be a way for them to make a little bit of money while they're training. Um, but we're going to get more into that next week when we get them on the show. And uh, we'll talk more about it. So it uh, gives me an excuse, too, to uh, update my website, uh, paythefighters.com. So they're kind of abandoned in recent months. I have done the damn thing. I'm a little bit distracted by all my court stuff. Um, so it's headed up for a big hearing on the 6th of March here, next Tuesday, so we'll see how that goes, but, um, anyway, uh, Sacramento, California, a bill has been introduced with the state assembly, which would create something even better for fighters, um, MMA fighters in particular, um, a pension fund. Uh, and I know, I'm not sure if it was California, but I know this was tried before for boxing. Um, and I believe it was, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name. But it was like one fighter in particular who was apparently selected to be the uh, first recipient of that boxing pension fund. I'm not sure if he ever, ever got it. Uh, Iran Barkley, actually, was the guy. I'm not sure if it ever came to fruition, but this is in California specifically, which actually holds more MMA fights than any other state. Uh, now, it's called Assembly Bill 1136, introduced by a guy with uh, a name very similar to a famous boxer. But it's not Devin, it's Matt. Matt Haney. H-A-N-E-Y. He's a Democrat from San Francisco, where they can shit on the sidewalk. <laughs> In public, uh, no problem. Uh, but he would require event promoters in this bill to earmark a portion of ticket sales to help these athletes have guaranteed income after retirement. Uh, this is an MMA fighters pension fund, and it's actually been supported by some big names, including uh, Ronda Rousey. You know, she's not fighting anymore, and she's technically retired and probably won't wouldn't benefit because she retired before this is going to take effect. She's supporting it. She said this bill is one of the first times I'm seeing folks think of these athletes as people rather than just a product and this bill isn't just good for the fighters it's good for California. Fighters have a say in where fighters are located 
and they're going to choose where fights are located and they're going to choose to have fights here in California because it's an investment in their future. So the bill would require just $1 per ticket sold to be invested into the fund along with a percentage of sales from merchandise and other revenue sources. Fighters would be eligible for the fund after the age of 50 if they fought in at least 14 fights in California. The amount of money they will be eligible for will depend on the length of their career and number of fights in California. No actual state funding would be dedicated to the fund. Uh, and uh, Assemblyman Haney said this pension fund is the right thing to do. It allows these athletes to save money for their retirement and creates a financial safety net to pay for medical bills. It's the first of its kind in the world of MMA and it's an important step to support these athletes who make MMA one of the fastest growing sports in the world. And by the time any fighter eligible reaches the age of 50, they're probably not going to have Social Security anymore because that will be gone the way this country is spending money. Uh, they're going to need it. So a similar fund actually exists in California. This is what I, I guess I was talking about. For boxers who have competed in the state. And this would extend the program to MMA fighters. I'm not sure if that was the same one that was targeting Rand Barkley to get the first game set up. But I do remember reading about it, the story. So those are our big news uh, events. Oh, also, uh, I forgot to mention Floyd Mayweather had a, a dismal, uh, dismally uh, attended exhibition against a guy from uh, reality TV. Uh, and he handled him easily, but apparently he broke his hand. I don't, I don't know whether that's official yet, but he thought he had broken his hand. He said that in the post-fight interview. But still won the fight, and uh, he blamed the UK for for having no fans in the stands when it, when it got underway. I don't know what other. Uh, Rich, are, are, those, are those fights pay uh, per view? I think so. Yeah, he he did. He, you gotta be kidding me! Yeah, right. I know it's ridiculous. Ain't it? He made like millions of dollars, so That's, I think almost all the money came from pay per view. I understand that when he was when he was fighting champions and fighting real boxers, but this oh, he yeah. really expects people to pay for it. Unbelievable! Yeah. Wow. I mean, his only other income source uh, is, is gambling, as far as I know. I mean, obviously, he probably does you know appearances and stuff like that. Um, you know, celebrity fees, basically. Uh, but yeah. It's all, all all exhibition too, you know. He, he fought Logan Paul there, famously he looked kind of rusty, but uh, obviously got the job done. <coughs> no, Logan claimed he won. Uh, oh yeah, it's gonna be interesting. Oh, speaking of Logan Paul, what a classless piece of shit that guy is. They gave him the microphone <laughs> during the fight with his brother. And this is just one of the reasons why he's a piece of shit. And and he cursed the whole friggin' Fury family in in, in the middle of the, the friggin' match. Um, does it surprise you? Mm, it doesn't surprise me, but I mean, jeez, you got you got the whole entire crowd listening to you, and, and you're gonna talk smack like that and be that disrespectful to the guy's whole family? Like, at least concentrate on the fight in the ring. <laughs> I don't. Don't be bad mouthing somebody's whole family. I mean, granted, they're all involved, like you know, especially Fury's father. Well, he's, I, he's his stepfather, and possibly or no, I think he is his father. But um, I heard actually Fury isn't his real name. His, his, his name is something else. Uh, but he just took the Fury name anyway. Uh, also. He had been telling people to bet the, bet the mortgage on Jake um, that Logan had. And, and supposedly, I don't know if this was deemed true, but um, he I read some headline that uh, a Logan had risked his equity in the prime uh, hydration drink on, on Jake. 
so I, I have no idea if that's true, but yeah, that's not as big as um, uh, Drake. You guys hear about Drake? The, the famous. Uh, I heard you know, his name mentioned, but I really rapper there haven't followed the story. He bet something like a a hundred thousand Bitcoin or something like that. Oh Jesus! Uh, and lost it all on Jake Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Anyway, speaking of lost it all, I lost all my bets on Brendan Allen because he got a submission <laughs> instead of a decision against Andre Muniz, uh, who was was a submission artist going in, and uh, it was pretty crappy. Just, just not really uh, able to deal with Brendan's style. He had a better first round than any other round, but second and third just was all Brendan Allen and. Uh, he looked like he was cruising to the win, and Andre was escaping every submission, getting thrown at him, and then uh, just a rear naked choke locked up, and it was literally like just less than, a little bit more than 30 seconds before the bell, 4 minutes and 25 seconds into the third, although I don't, I'm not sure if they had changed it to a five-round fight, I don't think they did, because it was on such short notice, but uh, yeah, that was not... That was not something that made me happy at all. <laughs> so Brendan Allen got the win. And then um, I had been betting this last two weeks that at least $1 on every fight that I knew wasn't going to be a lopsided victory to go to a potential draw. And this is the second straight week we had no draws. So that's another one that pissed me off. Uh, <clears throat> And then we had Augusto Sakai winning by decision over Dante Mays. Tatiana Suarez. This is one I got. Uh, I got this one in the parlay too. Tatiana Suarez by submission. Uh, looking at her record, I was pretty sure that was how I was going to go. And Montana De La Rosa lost that one. It was in the second round, 4 minutes and 15 seconds in. And then Mike Mela. Versus Johan Lanes. That was a submission. I got that one wrong. It was a first round submission. Four minutes, exactly the same. Four minutes and 15 seconds into the first instead of the second. And then with one second left in the round, this is the other one I got in that parlay. Trevor Peak. I knew, uh, even though he has very little UFC experience, I knew he was going to get this win. I think this was his UFC debut, and he had like a Dana White contender series fight before it, so they consider this his debut. Uh, he got the knockout, which is one second left, and uh, I knew if he got the chance, he, that's how it was going to end. Uh, I predicted like in every every bet I had him involved in, every parlay, it was a knockout uh, if he was going to win. And Eric Gonzalez was just trying to tie him up and uh, contain him, and he just couldn't do it. Uh, he just... This is excellent at getting back up after being taken down. Uh, just picture perfect, uh, you know, get your base, get back up to your feet like they teach you in wrestling. And then he would just have to escape the grasp uh, and, you know, unlock the hands of Gonzalez and, and get back into fighting distance. And I was very impressed with peak style because, um, you know, like I was talking about like a year ago, a year or two ago, with uh, Andre Arlovsky, I was really impressed with his uh, back fist, which I didn't think uh, people threw enough in, a, in fights. You know, you see the spinning back fist a lot, but not a lot of fighters throw, throw like, back fists. Peak, instead of throwing the back fist, he was throwing, like, a modified hammer fist from the feet. And it was landing uh, beautifully. And, and everything else that he was throwing and landing was just close to knocking him out before the actual knockout came. So he had Gonzalez hurt a few times, but um, the, the final onslaught was just beautiful. So I was jumping up and down after that. <laughs> that put me right on the way to winning my biggest parlay of the day. Like 20 bucks, but still, it was big for me. I, I do the micro betting, they call it. Uh, which is kind of funny because I, I've been toying with the idea of like getting into one of these paid services where they give you the picks and, and there's one with like an unbelievable record like 176 and 12 and you can buy it just for the UFC and MMA cards um, and they're pretty affordable actually uh, that's one of the ones first ones I looked at but then there's this other group 
that uh, did not impress me so much, but they got a free training video. So I watched a free training video. And it's pretty much exactly what I'm already doing. Um, live betting. Live betting is where all the money is at. And I had just seen that in like a little tiny infomercial. And then I actually watched the full training video the other day. And, and uh, was like, well, after the training video, why would I even bother? Like, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of guys in the testimonials talking about how many thousands they made and everything. But, I mean, that, it was ridiculously priced. It was like hundreds of dollars. For, uh, and you have to buy it quarterly. You can't buy it monthly. So that was another reason. But anyway, they, the concept is micro betting. You just, you know, you go with live events. And, and the most interesting part of the training was he said that you don't really worry about the outcome. You know, everybody worries about the outcome. And he gave it pretty, pretty good advice, too. Like, don't go for your f favorite teams all the time, you know. But, uh, the whole concept is, you know, if you do micro betting, you just look at the odds. You don't worry about the outcome, you know, and you just put 50 cents here, 50 cents there on the next play or something like that, a dollar here on the next play, what's going to happen. Uh, and it works for all sports. And, and and what I've been doing is, I'll, I, I, unfortunately, I got into the college basketball betting, which is almost impossible to really do well at. But uh, every now and then you hit a good parlay. And my biggest mistake is I'll go through the list like right after the the matches start, and, and I'll just go with the team that's ahead by six or seven points and still has positive odds. String together five or six teams to get the big big odds in a parlay. Um, but the problem with that is, is college basketball is very unpredictable. I've never been pissed off more than last night. When Auburn versus Alabama, uh, Auburn was winning the entire game pretty much, and then it turned into a shit show. Two players got ejected from Alabama, so that made me it was like seven and a half minutes left. There was a big fiasco. They were uh, they had the time stopped for like twenty minutes, so they ejected two Alabama players, <clears throat> and then later in the match, two Auburn players fouled out. And then Alabama came all the way back from a huge deficit and, and ended up just demolishing Auburn. And I only had five bucks in bets on Auburn, but I could have won a lot of money. And they give you this option called cash out, which I had not figured out until like last week. So I could have cashed out for like 15 out of my $17 option on, on one of the biggest bets that I had on it. And, oh, I mean, it's, whether you've got $5 or $100 on the bet, it pisses you off when you could have cashed out, you know, only lost two bucks instead. I mean, like I said, I only lost five bucks, but it's just like the principle of it. it just pissed me off. Like, I, I need to learn when to just be like, all right, that's, that's plenty. I did it tonight, too, on Boston University. They were beating Army almost the entire game. And uh, ended up losing in overtime on a bet that I could have cashed out. It was like a small bet, but like they offered me a seven seven dollar cash out just before Army came back, and then they then it went down to like five bucks when Army started creeping close. So that was when I should have taken it. And I didn't cash out, but then there's been times where I cashed out and I shouldn't have cashed out. So, but it's basically if you get close to winning the bet. And sometimes it happens, like, if you've got one team that's already won and another team where it's still in action and maybe they're losing, they'll still give you a cash-out option because there's the potential they're going to lose the bet. So they'll give you an option to make more than what you put in on the bet to cash out. So, yeah, there's all kinds of things you got to figure out in this game. But I've been betting on everything. <laughs> Every. The worst, though, is tennis. I will never bet on tennis again. <laughs> I bet. I learned my lesson early in ping pong. Because actually that was one of the ones that uh, that was big in the pandemic. During the pandemic, ping pong was one of the only things that you could, could bet on. Uh, I think I had like 
nothing to do late at night and that was the only action going on so i put a couple bets down on it and i never went back but tennis i've gone back to like six or seven times and i always thought you know one of these underdogs would would come back and win but it's like it's one of those things like i know the sport i, I played it in, in high school so you know you'd think you'd learn but uh you know once somebody's up a set or you know even up in one of one of the sets that's uh going on like it's, it's really hard to come back so yeah don't bet on tennis <laughs> but yeah uh, so basically what I do is uh, usually I do one two dollar bets um, and I just try to string together parlays here and there um, but like I think I talked about it last week I, I made the stupid bet where when I got my winnings I put 80 bucks on a team called Pacific in college basketball and I will never do that again. <laughs> never. They can swing the point wise so many different ways. So yeah, anything can happen at the last second. And I saw it last weekend at, at Iowa. I didn't. I didn't have a lot of money on that one either. You know, a couple bucks, but uh, Iowa came back and, and probably the, the the craziest finish you will ever see to any sporting event. Uh, they were down 10 points with like a minute and change to go and they came back went to overtime and won and there was even a, a, a stare down I don't know if you guys watch sports center at all and see this stuff but it's been going around all week uh, the, the coach got so pissed off at the ref the refs holding the ball and, and the coach just walks right out on the court and just stares at him with a look of death doesn't say anything just stares at him <laughs> yeah right after that it was like the, the, one of the sports center guys said you know it was like he put a spell on him or something like, the team came back and responded and they won the game well anyway i've never really been a college basketball fan either i went to a couple games in school when i went to virginia military institute they actually gave us credit for marching tours if you, if you went to the basketball games so that's probably the most basketball I've watched prior to betting. <laughs> but, yeah, it's so unpredictable. So I try to stick with more reliable stuff like hockey and basketball. I'll tell you what I hate about these sports. I'll tell you what I hate about them. It's college basketball game is going to start at 7 o'clock tonight, right? Yeah. Not tonight per se, but, you know, um, game's going to be, and just say Auburn, Alabama, college basketball game. And it's going to be over by 10 o'clock. And at 10 o'clock, Fights are going to be on right after that. So at 9.55, you turn on ESPN or whatever channel it's going to be, and what you see is there's still six minutes left in the game, and the final two minutes take about two hours. Because <laughs> it's, you know, foul. Um, you know, um, oh, yeah, yeah. I hate that, too. Foul. This I guy's uh, free throws, and it's like, it just keeps going on forever. I mean, and I'm like, oh, great. I can, I can go, you know, log on to my computer for another half hour before. Well, my show fucking starts. Um, only time I've ever bet on any college basketball is I was at a job one time and they were doing a march. Well, they wanted me to do the March Madness. Well, I said, no, I said, I don't really watch it. Um, so it wouldn't be right for me to do something because I don't really know what I'm doing. And then the one guy said something. I made a smart his comment. I said, I'm not going to run it, but I'm going to enter it now just to beat your ass. <laughs> and I did. And I said, you know, it's pathetic because you watch this. I don't. I just pick blind. <laughs> and... And for the first two rounds, I was actually in the lead. Nice. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's um, very tough to predict which I, upsets are going to happen and who's going to end up. Well, I do want to talk about. I want to talk about something else college related. Um, last weekend, the reason I didn't watch any fights last weekend is I went to, and I'm going to segue it into this weekend as well, the Lock Haven Boxing Show, and I didn't get the chance to go up there this year and serve as a guest coach, uh, just because my schedule in the fall was absolutely atrocious. But, you know, I went up there on Saturday, and here's what I like about the Lock Haven show. You know, the team is, you know, not a powerhouse like it was when I was there. Um, you know, they got a, they got a much better gym than we do now, but the late two years, you know, as Dr. Cox was slowing down, and Coach Cooper doesn't get to put as much time in as, like, as he wants to. Um, we always had returning veteran fighters that always would help out when we were there. And, it's you know, you're not getting as much of that now. Um, 
but the show is still top notch and it's you know you know full capacity you know every year and what you see there is you see these young fighters well we had we uh, we didn't have any females on the main card uh, from Lock Haven last week but you have you know the last few years both young and men women and they're carrying on our legacy I remember when I was there I would look at some of the guys as they were from like the 80s and the early 90s and I felt like I was carrying on their legacy these guys are not only carrying on their legacy they're carrying on they're ca- carrying on my legacy um and you know we were able to induct coach cooper in the lock haven boxing hall of fame as well as a few other people i got to see you know teammates of mine that boxed alongside with me i got to see people that were you know people that i looked up to you know when i was joining the program and then people that i helped mentor and you know great show we had uconn there penn state uh, navy wasn't there uh, jimmy mcnally Navy coach is getting ready to retire this year. Um, we had North Carolina there. So it ended up being, you know, a, a good good show. Um, Lockheed even went one and two. Uh, the first kid they had won by stoppage. Second two guys lost close decisions. They could have won them both. They ended up not getting the call. But those are fights that helped them build their character for both the young men. I talked to them both afterwards. And then the veterans, we all went out later and we told Dr. Cox story and we laughed and I remember sitting there thinking man it's like how much I respect you know the people that I was with how much you know I like admire them at pers- uh, both personally and professionally and the one guy that was there was uh, a guest of ours uh, back in the day, Chuck Masaccio who I helped mentor my last semester and I said to him I said hey Chucky so they got a, a pro flight card this weekend that I'm going to. He goes, oh, where? I said, Newtown Athletic Center. And he went, ooh. Um, my last semester, they were having a fight card at Newtown Athletic Center. And originally, I was going to work corners with Dr. Cox. We get there, and they're like, we're low on officials. Tony, you got a, you got a certification. We need you to judge. And I'm like, oh, shit, man. I don't want to be ju- judging guys that I help train and they're friends of mine, but I'll do it. And then they're like, no, 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 we got another judge. Okay, what do you need me to do, back in the corners? No, we need you to ring it out. Okay, I can do that. Well, Chucky's fighting this kid, I forget where he was from. Uh, um, I don't think he was from Navy, he might have been from um, like Penn Tech, that only they had a program for a couple years. Big, strong, strapping guy. And we said to Chucky, before the fight we're like Chucky look in this like this arena like this auditorium where the fights were it had a window a big picturesque window and the sun sun was coming down it's, the sunlight is blazing right into the room and we're like do not face this corner because you're going to be looking directly in the sun and he came out second round sun got in his eyes and a left foot got him on the chin <laughs> so oh. when I said to him I said Chucky go to New South Athletic Center he said ooh Ooh, that was a bad memory. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm going. Yeah, I'm going to um, fight there on Saturday. Saturday afternoon, they're having a card. Uh, and that's about an hour from my house. Um, first time I've been there since 1998. When I was the, uh, I'm just gonna walk there get the get the uh, microphone. I'm like, yeah, need a ring in it, answer. Um, but no, that was nice to be able to go and see a good college. Um, you know, show again. I used to enjoy fighting on them. Um, and then um, tomorrow night, you know, we're going to. Uh, I, got, I got my tickets for Creed Three. My company paid for it, which is great. So I already got my tickets for that. It's IMAX. I don't know what the difference on IMAX is. They say it's clearer or something. I don't know. I'll find out. I mean, I'm going to see movies in IMAX, 3D, 4D, screen saber, wrap around. I. I mean, I guess it's better than, you know, when I was a kid going to the drive-in and seeing them on, like, this, you know, projection with shitty ass sound. Right. But anyway, um... So that's tomorrow night. My last betting story, yeah, I, sure. the other night, I, I had, like, uh, all my winnings from the previous weekend 
and uh, I cashed out like a hundred bucks. I had forty-four dollars to spend, and um, <clears throat> I, I really wasn't uh, even breaking even. And then I said, "Screw it! I'm gonna see what's live now. And I'm gonna throw a couple bucks together." And I really wanted the positive odds, so I went for the Canadians, one of the basketball teams, the NBA teams that was already winning. The Canadians were losing by one goal, and the Bruins were losing by one goal. Uh, and I got to go with the Bruins. That's my hometown team, you know. So I bet the Canadians and the Bruins, and the Bruins went to overtime. They got the tie. They went to overtime. They won overtime with four seconds left. Oh, I was ecstatic. And then the Canadians Ooh. ended up getting two points to win in the third period. And the basketball team was winning already. They won. So I ended up winning $94 on that bet. And then another bet with a similar, I think the Canadians and the Bruins too, but another basketball team or some college basketball team that was going late. So I won $44 on that one. And that was one of the cardinal rules I broke too, was don't chase your losses. You know, don't just bet to bet. And that's that's the one time it's paid off for me. And don't bet on your favorite teams, they say. But, you know, I got pretty good favorite teams. Uh, the Celtics and the Bruins yeah. are probably the ones that have made me the most money so far. So, But the 76ers did not help me tonight. They lost to the Mavericks. Well, they have some of the bitches. <laughs> but anyway, we have to get through the rest of this uh, UFC stuff. Jasmine Jared J Jesu Vicious. Uh, she was my first UFC bet last week before they even had all the options of how the win went. It was just the lines available, and I, that was the first bet I placed, and she won over Gabriela Fernandez. Uh, Jordan Levitt over, uh, that was a unanimous decision, by the way. Uh, Jordan Levitt over Victor Martinez by TKO. Elbows and knees in the first round. Two minutes and 33 seconds into that one. I did not see that coming. I also um, talked about this last week. Charles Johnson screwed me on my first UFC bet week and uh, I bet everything but the first round knockout and that's how he won. This one uh, I backed him too. I thought he was going to win this fight and he lost by split decision uh, to O'Day Osborne. I did not see that one coming. Joe Selecki I did get right. That was the third one in my Suarez peak parlay. Uh, he beat Carl Deaton by technical submission for a naked choke. And then the first fight was a majority decision. Nerlo Aliyev over Rafael Alves. Okay. I had him in a couple parlays, but not by that result. Let's see. Now this weekend we have a couple big ones. We're going to go through the Bellator card first. Uh, as I said, I won the golf parlay with Anasov. Uh, I kind of knew he was going to have the motivation coming back from a wartime environment. I also knew he was going to be a little rusty. And uh, Logan Storley, as as um, as much as he tried to change his game, this was a rematch, and he didn't want to go with heavy wrestling. He, he still had a tough time, and a much tougher time this time around. Uh, I don't even I don't even know what possessed me to say this fight was going to go the distance, knowing it was going to be a five round fight. But I guess it's because Storley um, lasted the whole time the last time. <coughs> uh, but Amosov being undefeated, I wasn't going to put any bets on Storley, even though I thought he might do better this time leading up to it. But uh, he actually did a little bit worse, and there was a few times where I thought they were going to stop the fight, but they let it continue, went the distance, and uh, Aroslav famously actually buried his belt in the Ukraine where he lived. He buried it in his house, and he ended up having to go back after the building was demolished and to, to dig it up to bring it back to the, to the fight this week. Uh, it was in Dublin, Ireland, so it wasn't too far from his home country. But uh, Logan just, just got beat up, uh, and it's just unfortunately for me, he's a very durable fighter. So it was a total unanimous decision win for Amosov. Uh, I didn't do so well on the undercards. I had uh, Carvalho and Queeley, and uh, a couple of parlays. I think I also had uh, Charlie Ward. He lost. Uh, 
Jeremy Kennedy won by a decision over Carvalho in the co-main event. Bryce Logan beat Peter Queeley by TKO in the second round. Two minutes and 32 seconds in. Sinead Cavanaugh over Janae Harding. She came back from a knee injury to win that one. Uh, Sierra and Clark, not during the fight, but you know before the, before the fight, she had some time off to deal with the knee injury. <coughs> Sharon Clark, uh, hometown guy. Nice Irish name there. He, he won at a catch weight, 149 pounds over Leonardo Sinise. And then Carl Moore, light heavyweight over Macy Rosansky. That was a unanimous decision. And as I mentioned, Charlie Ward lost for me. Unanimous decision to Mike Schickman. Mike the Marine, they call him. Oleg Popov over Gawkin Sarakam by unanimous decision. A heavyweight before that. And we had a first round TKO for the guy I made fun of last week for having a, 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 a dorky name, Norbert Novenyi Jr., <laughs> beating Andy Manzolo. The very first round, 3 minutes and 12 seconds in. I'm not going to go through the rest of them. But, uh, those are a lot of undercard fights. So the big one, uh, UFC 285, the return of John Bones Jones. And uh, apparently the, the first picture of him at heavyweight, um, even though they, I don't think they've had the weigh-ins yet. Uh, weigh-ins are probably weird. Uh, he's gone viral with uh, his 267-pound frame there after he's bulked up to heavyweight. He's going to be fighting Ciro Gagne, who's just 11-1 and one to Jones's 26-1, and one, with the one loss being to Matt Hamill by disqualification. I believe it was for 12-6 to six elbows. Uh, and supposedly, I don't know yeah. why he even bothers with it, but Dana White has been saying that he's trying to overturn that years after the fact. I don't know yeah, why. Yeah, he's not, that's not working. Yeah. I don't even know why you'd try. I mean, like, it's probably the, the one thing that um, Matt Hamill can go to his grave talking about. Hey, I got my only, the only loss of John Jones is because of me. You know, and and the story of that guy alone is it's pretty crazy. I mean, he's the only deaf fighter in the UFC history, as far as I know. Um, and why would you take that away from somebody like that? That's stupid. Anyway. Um, so John Jones facing Ciro Gagne. And the story that's been going around this week, because John Jones is... is a, you know, not not by far the favorite, but he's, he's a pretty decent favorite. He's in the negative. Um, is Cyril Gagne has confessed to being unmotivated to train and says uh, he only really started training a few weeks before the fight because he's lazy. Uh, and he does this all the time. Um, which I don't even know why he would go out and say that. But Could that be a mind game? Could, maybe. Could that be a gigantic mind game? Because there's something about this fight that I'm sensing the underdog. You heard it here first. Yeah, I Jones love it. Jones has always had trouble with guys tall. Yeah. Always. And I just, one, number one, I don't know if he hits hard enough. Weight and, and a three-year a three layoff. And the biggest struggle John Jones has had was against Dominic Reyes. And I just, I don't see Cyril Gagne fighting that way. Uh, the big story uh, everybody seems to be hyping is they think that uh, once Cyril Gagne gets taken down a couple times because John Jones, they say, has the way better wrestling, he's not going to be able to handle it. <coughs> um, and the same thing happened against Ngannou. He handled Ngannou taking him down. Yeah, but he yeah. lost. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, yeah, he lost the decision. Okay, yeah. but I mean, it wasn't a destruction. So, uh... So we'll see. And then you remember the first, uh, uh, the first Gunderson fight. Um, you know, you, you look at that one. I mean, you could easily make a case Jones lost that one. Now the second one, he stopped him. Gustafson. But right. Yeah, Gustafson. Yeah, I'm gonna say, I, I got Gustafson uh, in, in that first fight. So he's he's always been challenged with tall guys. And I I just there's something says <laughs> he's rusty. He's rusty it's, too. It's, 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 But, you know, there's a first time for everything. 
So right. uh, I'll stick with it and see what happens. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I threw a little bit of money at Gagne already. Um, but um, we'll find out. I like I like his chances. I just, there's just so many unknowns as far as, like, you know, um, how hard has John Jones been training? You know, he's been out of the cage for over two years now. Um, hasn't had any live action. Almost three. Yeah. Hasn't really had any live uh, competition. Uh, and he's been doing a lot of weightlifting, too, which, you know, for me... In my boxing career, I always stayed away from weights um, because there was there was an interview I saw with Angelo Dundee one time where he said that you know lifting weights just shortens your reach, so you shouldn't do it as a fighter at all. Uh, or, or not not heavy ones like John's doing. John's doing powerlifting. Yeah, I mean heavy bench press, yeah. heavy heavy deadlifting. Uh, I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with weights. Just don't overdo it. I mean you're not a bodybuilder. Right. This isn't a bodybuilding or a powerlifting competition. So, I mean, I've, I've actually seen John Jones before he went to the UFC. I was at an event at Foxwoods that he fought at, and I didn't even realize it until years later when I looked back at the card. Uh, we'll just talk about betting. You know, that's where, where I lost my first live event bet. I had to pay in quarters. I didn't even have a, like a big bankroll on me or anything. I just had a couple rolls of quarters in my briefcase. Uh, and this kid who knew the opponent of my my friends, uh, my friend went with me. He was on. I gave him a camera and to do, do some photography. He'll get in for free. And, and he knew the guy, and he was like, "Oh yeah, he's gonna win." So I bet five bucks on this kid, and he lost. <laughs> yeah, these kids are laughing all the way to the bank to exchange their quarters for dollars. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, John Jones got a quick win there, and uh, you know, I've I've seen him have some challenges and stuff like that, but he just always seems to pull it out. He, he's still one of the most interesting fighters as far as his style. He's, you know, it's, you know, if you look at some of his biggest wins, he it's, it comes down to the dynamics of his fight game. He does things that nobody else does. He does a lot of spinning elbows. Uh, the oblique kicks are big, you know. Uh, he kind of tenderizes your your uh, shins with these oblique kicks, which nobody else really does. Um, and, and it's basically just kind of, you know, taking a step to the side, and it looks like you're going to do a side kick to the stomach or the head or whatever, and, and, he, and he kicks you right in the shin. Um, so a guy like Gagne, I think, is going to be particularly vulnerable to stuff like that. And... and uh, I don't know. I, I think it's going to be closer than a lot of people think. It, it all comes down to, you know, how does this layoff really affect John Jones to me? Because um, Gagne is the fresher fighter, but he also has the least experience of the two. Um, and, and his biggest challenge was Nganu, who was really a monster at heavyweight. Uh, whereas John Jones, this is his first time stepping up to that kind of weight. So that's another factor. We don't know how he's going to handle that. I have a feeling he's going to handle it well. I mean, I think he's going to win. Uh, the odds say that he's going to win. Uh, but, you know, it all depends on what, what kind of training Gagne's doing in his you know, limited fashion, apparently. Um, who he's bringing in to mimic John Jones, how, how he's, how he's going to handle the takedown attempts and the wrestling. And apparently, uh, I did read today that Bo Nickel, who is the biggest favorite on this entire card, despite only having three MMA fights, three and zero, he's a negative fifteen hundred favorite going in. Bo Nickel has been wrestling with John Jones, uh, training for this fight. He's only a middleweight, granted, but um, I guess that's why he's a fifteen hundred favorite. Uh, he's fighting Jamie Pickett, who's thirteen and eight. He's, he's got uh, way more fights, uh, but also, you know, the eight losses. So he's a plus 900 underdog. Ciro Gagne is plus 145. Jones is negative 170 right now, but it's, it's been going back and forth a little bit. I think I've seen it at 165 negative. But, yeah, the only other, there's two other 
fighters who are a little bit lower than nickel, but still pretty high favorites. Obviously, um, Valentina Shevchenko in the co-main event. She is negative 750. Negative 750. There's one other fighter here somewhere. Oh, Gary. Who is from the UK. Ian Gary, he's undefeated at 10 and 0, fighting Keenan Song, who's 19 and 6. He's not quite 750. He's negative 730. Two songs, 530. So I got, I got Song in one of my picks to pull off the upset there. Well, away, but Gary looks, looks pretty good in his limited UFC action. So that's kind of a shot in the dark. And then we've got Rachmanov coming in right under that. He is 16 and 0, also undefeated, fighting Jeff Neal, and um, that's a welterweight fight. I'm probably going to bet on what the outcome is going to be because the odds will be higher for that. But I'm going to pick Rachmanov there. Just got to look at you know his record and what he has more of knockouts or submissions. But he's fighting uh, Jeff Neal, who's 15 and 4. He's a plus 390. And Rachmanov is a negative 490. 490. Then we got Matus Gamrot, 21 and 2 against Jalen Turner. I think this could be the fight of the night. Jalen Turner, 13 and 5. Gamrot, 21 and 2. Gamrot is favored, but um, Turner is just 185 plus 185 to his negative 215. Yeah, I think Gamrot's coming off a loss too, so. That's going to be a good one. And uh, Trevin Jones, 13-9, and nine, going in against Cody Garbrandt. He's had a lot of ups and downs in recent years. He's 12-5. Uh, uh, just when he looks like he's getting his shit together, he usually just gets knocked out somewhere. <laughs> Cody, so uh, I'm surprised. He's actually the favorite going in here. Uh, he's a negative 175 to Trevin Jones, plus 150. And the only one that's closer than, than that in the odds is, is the female fight. Um, Vivian Araujo, who's 11-4 and four against Amanda Rebos, who's 10-3. and three. And obviously that's a great matchup on paper. Uh, it's a flyweight fight. Um, but that's uh, plus 100 for Araujo, negative 120 for Rebos. And then Derek Brunson versus Drikas Duplessis. Duplessis looked good in his last few fights, but uh, I think Derek Brunson has a has a better fight game. He's got a little bit more experience. He's twenty three and eight to Duplessis is eighteen and two, but Duplessis has a better winning percentage. So he's a negative two twenty five to Brunson's plus one ninety. That's the next closest. Uh, Garbrandt and Jones is pretty close too. <coughs> and then we go to. Julian Marquez, they call him the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> kind of a weird nickname. I don't know how he got it, but uh, he was nine and three, fighting Mark Andre Barriolt, who has a lot more experience. He's fourteen and six at middleweight, and uh, he is plus one thirty to Barriolt's negative one fifty. So they, they're expecting that to be a little closer than many might think. And we've got the Gary versus Song fight. Leo Mana Martinez in the fourth fight of the night. He's ten and three, fighting Cameron Saman, who is seven and zero. Oh. I believe he has a lot less UFC experience um, than Martinez. He is a negative two sixty five to Martinez is two twenty five. Just because he's undefeated. And then Jessica Pena, very tough fighter to predict how how the action is going to go. She's got. Great experience. She goes to a lot of decisions. She's 14 and six, fighting Tabitha Ricci, who's seven and one at straw weight. I'm pretty sure this one's going to go to the distance as well. Pena's plus 255. Ricci's negative 305. Uh, but it could get could be a stoppage. Probably if it is a stoppage, I would guess by decision because Pena can take some damage. I've seen her in some real tough fights, take a lot of damage, and just walk through it. And then Damon Blackshear, I got him in a couple of my parlays against uh, Farid Basharat, who is a big-time favorite, negative 450, because he's 9-0. and But uh, once again, not a lot of UFC experience. Blackshear is 12-4-1, plus 360, but he's got, uh, he's got some stoppage power at Bantamweight. 
And then another undefeated fighter in the first fight, Esteban Ribovic. 11-0 against Loik Radzibov, who's 16-4-1. And, and is the Radzibov is the favorite, despite Ribovic being undefeated. Negative 250 to Ribovic's plus 210. So that's that. Um, I'm probably going to lay out my... Start laying out my major bets tomorrow, depending on how I do. So I gotta gotta rely on the Canadians again tonight. They just started. I got one bet on track to win 20 bucks with the Bruins, Canadians, and I think uh, Red Wings. No, Red Wings lost. Anyway, I got two or three teams and one. So. I hope it's not one of my cash out regrets. <laughs> I've already gotten a cash out offer of five something. Cash out on that one. So then we got the PFL happening tomorrow. We've only got four fights there. Uh, featherweights, all featherweights. Brian Zercher, 4 0 against David Evans in the main event, who's 5 1. Nathan Kelly, 6 2 against Zachary Hicks, 8 4. A go Huskick, 8-5 against undefeated Gabriel Braga, who's 8-0. And, oh. and then the leadoff fight is Vika Singh Ruhil, 12-6 against James Gonzalez, who's 9-5. And, and I have not heard of any one of those guys. So. Uh, I don't know what to tell you about how that's going to go. And we've got championship, one championship Friday night fights tomorrow night as well. From Bangkok, Thailand. Yeah, this is weird. I'm not telling you anything. I don't know if it's it didn't load properly. We don't usually talk about one championship anyway, but uh, it's on the list of upcoming fights, so I figured I'd mention it. <coughs> sure, dog is trying not to show us any of that. <laughs> Yeah, they just got an ad in, in the way, so I don't, I don't know who's fighting who, but uh, the one championship Friday night fights are on tomorrow night. That's weird. Alright. Till next week, I believe that's all we have for tonight, and we're going to have our guest Matt Bergen on next week. He's going to talk about his fighters only, or only fighters. I'm not sure exactly which it is. Let me just check found him through my Zion Sucks connection on uh, Twitter. It's my biggest, uh, my biggest Twitter profile. His description he offered is, uh, says, I'm working to help fighters be able to make a recurring revenue stream so they can get their bills taken care of more easily and focus into training and fighting. Similar business model to what OnlyFans has, but we're more beneficial towards not only our creators, fighters, but also our fans who are rewarded with a cryptocurrency called Yeti Coin for basically everything they do. Logging in, liking the post, watching a video, commenting, and more things as we go. Uh, fighters are all now also able to get paid for training because of the Yeti Coin rewards that are given out. Only fighters, that's what they're called. Just like only fans. But no nudity. <laughs> As far as I know, I mean, I don't know. Maybe they'll have to, to make the real money. <laughs> so that's it for us. And uh, hopefully I come away with a few hundred bucks this weekend. I seem to get better every weekend. I got uh, the golf bets are all in. I uh, I was surprised, actually. Uh, Chris Kirk was, was right up into the, the lead earlier today. Uh, again for the golf but uh, the guy who won the bigger PGA Tour event prior to that John Rahm ended up stealing the lead at the end because he was he was hadn't finished yet but uh, Kirk finished early in the day so John Rahm came back and stormed right up to the lead with a real strong finish today but I'm surprised I'm even talking about golf but <laughs> now I'm betting on it and the the second most Easy sport to bet on is NASCAR. Uh, 
and even though I didn't pick Bush last week before the race, I, like I said, I had all the top ten people before, before it ended up being Bush, and I, I thought about picking him. I knew that he was one of those names that could be in the top top few, but I never fall for the favorite. Their favorite every week seems to be Kyle Larson, and he never finishes high. <laughs> they, just, they just put him up there. Like, you got to pick him. But anyway, um, and I even did the Xfinity Series race last week. I picked like 15 out of 20 people in the Xfinity Series race, and none of them, none of them paid off. But I didn't, I didn't make big bets, so it didn't matter. Um, I actually put like a bunch of 10 cents and 20 cents bets on the, on the real underdogs there because of you know the potential for wrecks. But it's just got to be the best odds you can get prior to the match starting uh, because there's so many different people that you can bet on. So it's very easy to make a little bit of money if you're smart about it. You know, don't bet anything more than five bucks. And, you know, do some research beforehand. I actually put uh, like a 50 cent bet on one guy that if he wins the golf, I guess the Puerto Rican Open and the uh, the Arnold Palmer, Palmer Invitational going on this weekend. If he wins the Puerto Rican Open, this one guy, I win $5,000 on a 50-cent bet. <laughs> Obviously, it's probably not going to happen. But yeah, you got to throw something at it just in case. I think it's more likely in the NASCAR stuff because of the wrecks, you know. But this this Arnold Palmer Invitational I saw on the um, one of the betting shows I watch, Daily Wager on ESPN, they said that tomorrow's going to be really... a the toughest day because a lot of these people are going to be teeing off when there's going to be real high winds uh, in the forecast. So that could fuck everything up. So who knows? Maybe one of my underdogs will come out and win. I think I'd be... Well, the other thing about live betting, too, on it is during the whole first round the odds are, are not changing that fast as, as the results change. So I was able to get uh, a couple people that are in the top five before their odds went lower. So, that's what it is. It's going to be my side hustle, I think. As long as I don't lose too big. You know. It's tough, though. When you're micro betting, it's really tough to lose a lot of money. Unless you have like five or six bad days in a row. I've had like one or two, but never like three or four bad days. It's always like. When I think I'm going to quit, it's like, bam, that's when the big one comes in. So anyway, we'll see what happens. And hopefully Gagne pays All off right, and we can, we can keep Tom as the psychic. See you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a good night. Adios. Till next week.